We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I hope everyone on Zoom can hear me. Um, if not, just signal to us in some way that you cannot hear us. Um, uh, good afternoon. My name is Olivia Hagedorn. I am a postdoc and program manager for VCU Community Engaged Scholars, um, and I'm also coordinating this summer's uh, summer bridge experience for the Communities Without Walls and HRI. Um, and I'm joined here with Peggy Brennan, who is um, one of the directors of HWW. Um, and we are happy to talk about this program and answer any questions that folks have as they think about applying. Um, and yeah, we're just gonna go over the origins and some of the details about the application process and the program itself. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the origins of the program. So it was founded in 2020 with support from the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Um, and it's really founded with two guiding principles in mind, um, which are sort of encapsulated with this catchy little phrase that Peggy and Lee put together, which is the humanities have a lot to offer, humanists have a lot to learn. Um, and so with the first part being that training, training in the humanities helps us think about the world um, around us to center the human concept to speak across and through multiple contexts and boundaries and that the humanities help us relate in deep and meaningful ways. Um, and then the second part of this phrase that humanists have a lot to learn, that this program is not about sort of sending experts out into the world with advanced degrees to tell our community partners what they should be doing, um, but rather it's rooted in this idea that humanists are moving across different contexts that we're listening to, that we're understanding what people need, um, that all of these things are difficult, that they take a lot of work, that they take a lot of time, reflection, and careful, um, careful consideration of the factors at play. Um, and what's connecting these two ideas, of course, is this idea of reciprocity, um, meaning that learning for humanities is never sort of unidirectional. Again, like we're not the sort of academic experts who are going out into the world, um, sort of bestowing knowledge on our partners, but rather that students and community organizations um, can learn from one another through mutual collaboration and partnership. And so that's sort of the bridge program in a nutshell. Um, it aims to create reciprocal partnerships between graduate fellows in the humanities and community organizations within the Champaign-Urbana area. Um, and some of our partners are outside of the Champaign-Urbana area, most part, um, I think most of the partners within Bridge have been within the sort of Champaign-Urbana city limits. Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the sort of nuts and bolts of the program. This is an eight week project-based experiential learning program. So roughly 20 hours a week over eight weeks in the summer, um, beginning in mid-May running through um, the end of July, start of August. Um, I say approximately 20 weeks because as someone who completed, 20 or 20 hours um, a week, thank you. Uh, as someone who completed Bridge, sometimes you're gonna work maybe 30 hours for one week, another week you might work 10 hours. It really depends on what your community partner needs and what um, their particular needs are for any given moment. Um, in addition to that, you will work on a project with a community organization that we pair you with through VCU, Community Engaged Scholars. Um, so VCU is a campus program that um, I work for uh, that works with community partners in our area to sort of match student expertise with community partners in our area while centering community partners' priorities and community partners' needs. Um, and so project matching will begin immediately after fellows are selected. Um, and we look at a lot of different things whenever we think about matching you with a community organization. A lot of the things come from your application materials themselves, but also the skills that you would like to um, learn, the skills that you already have, um, and the needs and priorities, of course, of our community partners. Um, with the last point, again, the needs of our community partners being the sort of the first thing that we start with at VCU. And so once you're paired with a community partner, you will start working on a project um, that again will sort of serve a vital area of need in our community. Um, I'm going to go over some examples um, a bit later in the um, presentation about 
um, different projects that um, fellows have completed um, for the past two years. Um, but I should note that WCU has active relationships with over 200 different community organizations in the Champaign-Urbana area alone. So there's really no shortage of possibilities um, when it comes to project matching. Um, and yeah, there, there are a lot of exciting things happening outside of the sort of campus bubble that our community partners would really love to collaborate with um, our graduate fellows on. And then finally, I should note, um, all things with Humanities Without Walls um, are supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And so this program is supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation and Humanities Without Walls. And so we should give recognition to that. So the benefits of participating in this program. Um, you guys are all here because you're interested in the program um, and you're all humanists. Um, so part of this might seem obvious, but it's an opportunity to apply your humanistic training and skills in new ways. Um, and I say this meaning that it's an opportunity to stretch your, your training and your skill sets outside of that sort of campus bubble that we often sort of find ourselves in whenever we are graduate students. Um, it's an opportunity to sort of diversify um, the different networks and areas that you are learning. Um, so much of what we learn as graduate students can often sort of come from our advisors or from our coursework, but what Bridge is really trying to emphasize and what Humanities Without Walls also emphasizes is this idea that so much of our education so much of our learning can come from areas that are not within that campus levels, that our community partners are experts in their fields. They know a lot of things that are happening, um, not only in our community, but in nationally, internationally, and that they're a critical source of information and training and that we should cultivate those partnerships. Um, it's also an opportunity to develop new skills and experiences. So not only in terms of networking outside of academic, academic context, right? So, so much of our networking, when we think about networking um, as PhD students comes from sort of like the traditional research or teaching or conferences. This is an opportunity to sort of think about networking um, in new ways. So networking with community partners, networking with folks who are being served by our community partners, um, as well as your fellow um, fellow fellows, your, your cohort members um, who are also applying to this program and interested in similar ideas around reciprocity, community engaged learning, um, and possibly community engaged teaching. It's also an opportunity to think about the different ways that your skills and experience um, as a humanities researcher translate um, outside of an academic context. And this sort of connects to the last point here, which is um, explore unfamiliar career paths. Um, so often I think that we enter into a um, humanities PhD program with this idea of what our career should look like. Um, and sometimes that doesn't always pull, um, pan out in the way that we want it to, or we get entrenched in those programs and we realize that maybe tenure track line or teaching is not for me. Um, and so this is an opportunity to just think about what would a career outside of a tenure track or outside of a teaching position or a research position look like. Um, and so this is the ability to explore that perhaps within a nonprofit um, setting um, or to think about what work might look like for a local community government or um, an academic unit on campus. So one of our fellows was previously um, matched with the Women's Resource Center on campus. So it's an opportunity to um, explore career paths that might not be in necessarily in your orbit. Um, and I guess another thing that I would add to this as well is this ability to sort of explore unfamiliar career paths in an environment that's safe and welcoming to those conversations. And so again, you're with your fellow cohort members who are also perhaps questioning their commitment to academia or excited about um, reaching out to other humanities PhD students who are thinking about working in nonprofits. And so it's an opportunity to like, have these conversations about career diversity and new career paths in a safe environment that isn't necessarily with your advisor or not necessarily within your department. Next, it pays pretty well for a graduate associateship. So again, it's 20 hours of work over eight weeks in the summer. 
um, with a stipend of $6,800. Um, and I can answer more questions um, about the stipend if folks have them later on, but um, there are some sort of stipulations um, that we can set you up with folks in HR to talk about sort of the taxes and whether or not you have to be enrolled, but the base salary is $6,800. Um, and finally, um, I kind of mentioned this already, that this program provides mentorship and career development and exploration. So not only with, in terms of your cohort members and me um, as the sort of coordinator of this summer's program, but also mentorship from the wonderful folks at Humanities Without Walls on campus, as well as Derek Attig in the Graduate College office. Um, and so you'll again have the ability to sort of talk through, um, to have sort of some guidance from someone who isn't necessarily your advisor or professor in your program. Um, I'm going to pause here and if you have, if anyone has questions about the specifics um, about the program or the benefits of participating, um, I'm going to give folks a minute just to ask questions if anything has popped up. Some yeah. questions. Um, so this, are you going to talk more about the WCU and how organizations can be part of that later? Yeah, I can talk about that now. So um, for the folks on Zoom, in case you couldn't hear, the question was um, inviting me basically to speak a little bit more about WCU community engaged scholars and sort of how um, we form partnerships with community organizations. So WCU has been um, around since the summer of 2020. It was started, uh, founded in the, the middle of the pandemic. Um, and so we form partnerships with community organizations through a different campus partner known as the Community Learning Lab. And so basically we start with our community partners. Um, we start by, we have a team of um, a director as well as a team of graduate students who work in the School of Social Work who do a lot of outreach to our community partners. They talk to them on the phone, they email them, um, and it really starts with soliciting what they're identifying what their needs and their priorities are as a community partner, um, and then moving out from their priorities and their needs to the university rather than starting with the university and moving to the community partners, if that makes sense. And so we work with our community partners to sort of identify, you know, what is it that you are looking for? What supports can we offer from the university standpoint? What sort of expertise do you need? What are, what are your objectives? What are your priorities? And then we move from the community partner to the University of Illinois. Um, and in terms of project matching, a lot of that is just, again, looking at your application materials, reading what it is that what skill sets you've identified in your application materials, what your resume and CV tell us about, you know, what it is you're interested in, what, what you're able to do. And then going again back to the community partners and asking them if they would be willing or if they see a partnership at play. Does that answer your question? Um, I guess I was more wondering on the, on the like write up online, it says that the, these are community organizations that are addressing a vital community need. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you were working specifically with like, a groups or something like is there a specific kind of organization that you're looking for to join WCU? Yeah, so for the folks on Zoom, the question um, was, is there a specific type of organization that WCU sort of seeks to partner with? Um, the answer is we don't have like a specific set of criteria that a community partner has to sort of like meet in order to become a WCU partner. So a lot of our organizations are classified as like a nonprofit, you know, um, working as like aid, whether that can be like after school programs or um, I'm trying to think of different ones, uh, you know, direct aid to different underserved or historically excluded communities, um, to uh, like uh, salt and light, you know, like a local store where the profits are donated. Um, back to the community, all the way to some of our partners are actually um, uh, like the city um, Champaign-Urbana Public Health um, District is one of our partners, right? So we have a really broad definition of what our community partners can be. It's not necessarily a nonprofit or um, what we think of as sort of a community organization. It can, we have a pretty broad definition of what that can be. Um, our main focus is if they're serving our community, are they trying to make Champaign a better place to live? 
Um, and do they adhere to sort of the principles of reciprocity of, um, yeah, uh, of we see you. Does that answer the question? Yeah. We have a question on Zoom. Do you know if any community organizations would appreciate or benefit from our remote virtual work or organizations seeking in-person work? Should this factor into a decision to apply to this program? Okay, yeah, this is a really great question. Um, so more and more of our partners are moving back toward um, in-person work. Um, and so it's becoming increasingly um, the reality of sort of returning back from the pandemic that more and more of our partners really want that sort of face-to-face -face interaction with our students um, at VCU. That said, um, some of our partners are willing to accommodate remote work. Um, and I can let, maybe Tori can speak a little bit about this as well, but oftentimes with our projects at VCU, um, projects may be somewhat in-person and then a lot of the work is done remotely and then you go back to the organization and you do some work. And so it's maybe a balance or what we would call like a hybrid type project. Um, so I don't think that it should factor into your decision to apply to the program. Um, if you have a specific need for a remote project or maybe you definitely want to do an in-person project, um, it would just be something to convey to us early on um, after be being selected for the award so that we know that we can be upfront with our community partners that this person needs a remote project um, or this person would really like to do in-person work. Um, then, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, great. Any other questions about the benefits or the basics of the program? I have a short question, yeah. sorry. Um, I apologize. I guess it's hard to tell who's. Um, it says on the, again, on the website, it says up to 6,800. Mm -hmm. And so you said that was a baseline. So is it, I just don't know which way it goes. Yeah, that's um, a holdover, I think, from previous iterations of the program. So the baseline is $6,800. Um, that it's paid out in two, two payments. So I believe the first payment will be like June 16th. The second payment is July 16th, um, based on, you know, the fellowship starts on May 15th. Um, so it's paid out in two installments. Um, and yeah, it's, it's $6,800. Um, the question of, you know, whether or not taxes are taken out or whether or not um, you have to be enrolled, those are questions that um, our HR team and um, the graduate college or your own department would be able to answer. Um, but the baseline pay is $6,800. I'm going to move forward, and if folks have questions, you can just pop them in the chat. Um, so I'm going to go over a few different projects and sites that our fellows participated in last year. Um, and I can also talk about my own project because I was a fellow in 2021. Um, so last year, we had four fellows participate in the program. Um, Tori, Victoria, who's sitting next to me, um, worked right, uh, for the media research and analysis for the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District's Equity Council, um, and she's going to talk more about that in a moment. Um, we had another fellow who did development of volunteer training materials for one of our more um, active organizations in our community called DREAM, and so DREAM is a partner that WCU has worked with, I think, every semester that I have been at VCU. Um, and they're one of our really wonderful partners who do a lot of after school trainings, after school tutoring for young students in our community. Um, a different fellow did survey design and assessment design at the Champaign County Mental Health Board. And then finally, we had a student work on curriculum design um, and sort of curriculum reviews for the Champaign-Urbana Freedom School um, at the Garden Hills Academy. Um, and then my own project, whenever I was a fellow in 2021, I actually did website design um, for Project Success of Vermilion County, which is the county next to Champaign. It's about a 45 minute drive to Danville. Um, and I did website, website design um, and um, some needs assessments for that organization around their sort of communications materials. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about my own experience, uh, but right now I'm gonna hand it over to Victoria who was a fellow in 2022. Um, and yeah, I'll hand it off to you if you want to speak a little bit about your own experiences um, and why you think folks should apply. 
Awesome. Hello, everyone, and hello. Um, it's nice to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Victoria Fields. I also go by Tori. I am a second year PhD student in the Department of Education, studying social movements with the emphasis on race and gender. And last summer, I was an HWW Summer Bridge Fellow. So before I even applied, because HWW was on my radar for a while, <laughs> um, because I also earned my master's here. So I was super excited to apply as a doctoral student. So in my doctoral studies, I've often been reflective of my current self as well as my future self, um, just trying to figure out what I want to take away from my doctoral experience and the type of person I want to become when I leave here. Um, so being reflective in those moments helped me with my application and uh, justified my reason for applying. I also often thought of myself as a bridge because I am a uh, instructor of record in my department. So I often teach uh, tons of undergraduate students and I often try to bring my community experiences and volunteer experiences to the classroom. And I know I wanted to expand upon that um, in my doctoral training as well. So when looking at my future self, I knew that one of my goals were to one, of course, uh, uh, gain employment uh, in a tenure line track, but also become an administrator later on, specifically focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so I think that the HWW program did a wonderful job in pairing me with an organization to expand uh, my potential, but also help me gain real life skills to apply my interest as well as my doctoral training in one. So uh, as Olivia mentioned, previously, I worked with the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, also known as CUPHD, and I worked with their Equity Council, which was really important for me because the Equity Council was fairly new. Um, they started in 2020 due to two pandemics, one COVID, but also racism, addressing the George Floyd protest, and they wanted to gain a stronger connection, understanding, and build a stronger relationship with the Champaign-Urbana community. So within the Champaign-Urbana uh, Public Health District, I developed a toolkit, which was really nice because I was able to apply my doctoral training to a tangible product um, that could be included within my PhD portfolio, um, as well as within my CV. Um, and within that toolkit, I kind of like did my own Kind of literature review outside of academia, which I thought was really, really cool. So I researched uh, the history of race and community relations within Champaign-Urbana to really understand the structures within the community before I arrived, uh, thanks to this fellowship. In addition to my fellowship experience, I also had an amazing cohort, which was really nice because we were in it together and we were able to learn what worked and what didn't work and how to approach um, our organizations and how to get the best out of this fellowship within the eight weeks. Um, the staff was really supportive, Peggy's here, and we just, it was just so supportive and just welcoming, and they really enhanced our skills and just understandings of what we wanted to get out of the program. And then going back to CU PhD, um, it was just a really great experience. I worked with a, a member of the Equity Council and I did kind of like a hybrid approach. So I worked remotely, but then I worked in person to attend meetings and it was just really fun, but it was also bittersweet because at the end of my fellowship, they wanted to work with me even more, <laughs> um, which was amazing. So I just left the door open and then um, which was really great because my supervisor ended up writing a letter of recommendation for me after my fellowship. And I also received a certificate of achievement due to my um, equity toolkit that I created for CU PhD. But I also want to talk about some of the challenges that I experienced, um, which I think were very beneficial to my overall experience within Humanities Without Walls, uh, particularly the institutional issues. And I didn't know that coming in because this was a new experience for me. And what I mean by institutional issues is uh, how much um, 
or the lack of support that the Equity Council had um, in getting a, a jump start to really build a relationship with the community and also the different roles within uh, the Equity Council and the challenges that they had in different departments. Um, additionally, there were a lot of stakeholders, which I thought were, was really cool. However, I kind of had to make this like organizational chart to see who works well with each other, who does not, um, which is, I think, great experience too to learn like the systems and the proce process processes processes um, of the organization and institutional structures. Um, Additionally, uh, I also had to learn like the different policies as well as the outside institutional uh, structures that were uh, difficult for the Equity Council to encounter. Um, however, it did uh, uh, help me gain um, an amazing experience in terms of understanding who I was and my role within the Humanities Without Walls uh, Summer Bridge Fellowship and also my role within the organization. And I wanna go back to what Olivia mentioned at the beginning of the slide, specifically, humanities have a lot to offer and humanists have a lot to learn. And I really appreciate this reciprocal uh, experience because it also uh, enabled me to take my doctoral training outside of academia, which I think is really applicable and something that we don't really talk about as much, but it's also really valuable. And, and I'm so excited that I was able to participate in the Summer Bridge program because I've been able to bring some of these lessons back into the classroom, which I think is beneficial for my students. And also how to be a stronger diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist, how to work with different groups um, and also different individuals in different structures and process is and just so much so um i really had an amazing experience and i do encourage you to apply to the humanities without wall summer bridge fellowship thank you. Thank, you. thank you um i'm gonna open it up for questions for tori in a moment but i'm gonna take the privilege of asking the first question um because i think you said something really important um which was that you do want to pursue a career in the tenure track and you do want to pursue a career as an academic researcher teacher um and yet you still found a program like you found this so beneficial so i wonder if you could talk a little bit about like what is it that you're going to take with you mm -hmm. from this experience as you sort of pursue that career mm -hmm. within a tenure track line mm -hmm. absolutely i think that's a wonderful question because i've been the type of person that can't be put into a box <laughs> And sometimes I feel like academia does that, um, not intentionally, but I believe that experiences outside of academia are so valuable to academia. And that's one of the ways that we can grow, learn, and also uh, create new ways of knowing, new ways of being. Um, so one of the things that I will take away from this program is specifically how to employ DEI strategies, right? And also how to consider the community in that aspect. I think you brought up a really great point. And yes, we're humanists. We have a lot to offer, but we also have a lot to learn, right? So I didn't come into this process thinking that, oh, I'm going to tell CU PhD what they should do, right? It was really important for me uh, that the community, as well as the organization, had a voice because I knew, one, that this fellowship wasn't forever, but also these issues that CU uh, are, we're dealing with and are currently deal, dealing with affect di different demographic groups differently. And I thought it was really important for their voices um, to be heard and not just to be heard, but also to be employed within the decision-making process. Yeah, so, definitely. yeah. yeah. Um, I'll open up for other questions that anyone has for um, Victoria. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you said that it was nice to take your the knowledge that you were learning in the program here outside. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was wondering if you could expand on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, I think with me learning how different institutional structures work was really imperative for me because it was important to learn what I can take away from this particular institutional challenges that the CU PhD was facing and how I can employ that. For instance, I'm on my department's uh, diversity, equity, and justice committee. How can I think about diversity, equity, and justice more broadly based upon my experiences? So I do think that Humanities Without Walls uh, has enabled me to 
pile up these experiences within this fellowship and add them to different aspects of my life and more particularly as it relates to being a DEI strategist how can I like for example uh, reminisce not reminisce but uh, how can I um, employ this toolkit that I created for CU PhD and apply that to our department culture within the Department of Communication. Can you tell us what your dissertation is about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that may be a little bit what you're after, like how does the substance of your mm -hmm. communications training mm -hmm. feed into all these interests and translatable skills? Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I think my positionality matters a lot too, um, especially with me being a Black woman. So my dissertation is focusing on Black feminist movements in the 1970s to 1990s. So understanding how community groups, a specific community Community group organized, right, and also uh, worked against these institutional structures to get their voices heard, right? So studying a specific demographic group, Black feminists, during a particular time period helps me kind of like historicize our contemporary moments and bring out those strategies that they use that we're still using but can dive deeper into. Does that make a little bit more sense? Perfect. Thank and that's so great because I'll just say, everybody, I'm Antoinette and I um, direct HRI and also I'm a PI for HWW and we're always struggling in uh, graduate student career diversity to remind people that what brought you into the academy, the topics that you're studying um, are really important to keep front of mind as you're thinking about how to apply them elsewhere. So the skills and expertise you know, of the practical kind, but you're motivated powerfully by the urge and the necessity of rematerializing that history. Yes. And that totally informs all the knowledge as well as the skills that you bring, as well as the gaps that you recognize that you have. So that was the perfect yes. answer of how to match your intellectual or scholar or whatever we're calling them. Not to not to fetishize that or to say it's, you know, but but really the match there is so great yes. from what you just said. Yeah. Yes. Questions? I might ask one more question of you, um, which is um, about networking. So you kind of hinted at it. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the different networks you were able to establish, maybe with your fellow cohort members mm -hmm. or with HWW, perhaps informational interviews, that sort of thing. What um, What's networking? How did this program help you in terms of expanding your own network as a young professional? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a wonderful question. Um, I keep up with my cohort members in some way, shape, or form, whether it's like LinkedIn, Instagram, or some some form, just shape or form. Um, so we really became friends outside of the Summer Bridge experience, um, which is really um, helpful for me in deciding, okay, yes, I want to go the tenure line, but how can I keep up these connections to see what my other colleagues have learned outside of the tenure line track, right? And I think going with the informational interviews, um, it really gave me confidence to do an informational interview, which was really cool. So I met with someone who works for the Chicago Bulls, who does community relations with the Chicago Bulls. And I learned a lot because they, ha they even um, have a PhD. Right. And they work uh, in community relations. And I'm like, how does that process work? How do you take yourself out of this academic bubble, but also apply these academic skills to um, an organization? So um, this program gave me or this fellowship gave me the confidence to do that um, and to ask great questions and to really learn how I would fit outside of academia, mm -hmm. but also how I could uh, make my own fit within academia as well. Yeah. Um, so that was really awesome. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, cool. Well, if anyone has additional questions for Victoria, we can move on. We can ask them at the end. Um, but I'm going to move ahead with the application process. Just make sure that we have time at the end for questions. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. So I'm going to start with eligibility. And so the most basic part is that um, one, applications are due on March 1st, um, that is a hard deadline, um, and to be eligible, you must be currently enrolled in a PhD program in the humanities or humanistic sciences at the University of Illinois. 
Um, I recognize that that's somewhat of a vague phrasing of the humanities, but that's somewhat intentional, it's deliberate. Um, I would not get too hung up on whether or not your major um, classifies as a traditional humanist major. Um, I think if you look at past recipients, you'll see that we have a very um, broad definition of what counts as the humanities, and we're more interested in how your work, how your research, how you're thinking about um, and how you're centering the human experience um, and the principles of the humanities in your work rather than the sort of title of your program. Um, this is a summer program. And so you have to graduate after um, August, 2023. Um, so if you're graduating in May of this year, for example, you would not be eligible to apply. Um, and lastly, international students are eligible to apply for this fellowship. Um, that because it is paid through the university, there aren't necessarily any stipulations. And so if you're an international student and wondering if you're eligible, yes, you are, and yes, you should apply. Okay, so um, in terms of the application itself, it's a fairly simple application. And so the first part is a resume or a CV. Um, this is just to sort of give, when you're thinking about compiling your resume or your CV, you should think about what can I do to make sure that the selection committee has the context necessary to understand my application materials? Um, if you don't necessarily, if you don't have a resume or a CV, I encourage you um, to reach out to the folks at the graduate college, um, to reach out to your fellow colleagues in your department or your friends um, to sort of get examples. Um, but again, the, the emphasis here is providing us with the context, um, an outline of your career, your training to date, just so that the selection committee has a sort of rounded picture of where you've been, um, the sort of skill sets that you have. Because again, we use your resume and your CV, resume or your CV rather, um, whenever we start project matching. So think about that as well, whenever you're sort of putting together that particular document. Um, and so the most complicated or perhaps the most difficult part of this application process are the three statements that we are currently asking for. Um, and I'm going to go through each of these briefly. Um, the first, which I think is the hardest, which I will just read, what skills, areas of knowledge, or ways of looking at the world could you use to help a community organization make a positive impact? How could you foresee applying your humanistic training to advance an organization's mission? Um, this is a difficult question, but I would read it as an opportunity for you, again, to tell us a bit about yourself, your interest, your creativity and openness to think about how your training connects to the broader world in which you live, the community around you. Um, I think that you could answer this question in any number of ways. Um, whenever I applied, I answered it by talking pretty in depth about sort of the theoretical and the methodological questions and commitments that drove me to be a history um, major in the first place. And then I speculated how those commitments might translate um, outside of an academic setting. Um, and so one thing that I would emphasize in that is that there is a bit of speculation involved here, right? A sort of imagining of what you possibly could do. Um, and I think that we would encourage that. Um, we would encourage that openness, that vulnerability to say, I might not have experience in this, but this is what I imagine I could do with my particular set of skills. Um, other folks have approached it um, by tying together sort of the different elements of their life um, as a PhD student or a PhD candidate. So tying together research, teaching, theory in a way that sort of helped the selection committee have, again, a more full picture of who that candidate was um, as a scholar and as a humanist. Um, and yeah, Tori, do you have any uh, recollections or anything you wanna add to how someone might approach this particular question? Yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned speculation mm -hmm. because I think that's really important. Once again, tying back to like what, what I saw my future self doing as well as like the impact I wanted to make and how this organization could help me reach my current goals as well as my future goals. And I think this uh, emphasis on like ways of looking at the world is also really important because I think it's just individuals as well as academics, we have different ways of looking at the world, which may have inspired why we wanted to get a doctorate in the first place. Um, so 
channeling why you wanted why you want to do this, but also the ways of looking in terms of understanding what you have to offer in terms of speculation and future goals. So, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take questions about the statements at the end. I'm going to go through all of them first, though. Um, so the second question that we are asking for you to answer is how would this experience contribute to your career development? What do you hope to learn from working with a community organization in the summer? What skills would you like to gain or develop? Um, and so like that first question, um, this one is again, trying to help the committee assess sort of your willingness or your readiness to be vulnerable when it comes to career diversity. Um, and I say that meaning if you again want to go into the tenure track, this is not like you're not excluded from applying. We would actually encourage you to apply um, because I think as Tori mentioned, um, and as many of us know that so much of being an ethical professor in the tenure track is knowing about career diversity, having experiences of working outside of the sort of campus bubble, being engaged with community through your research, through your teaching and what have you. Um, if you're struggling, again, I think this one would also evolve, involve a little bit of speculation, right? So you know what skills you currently have, um, but you might not know what skills you need right, or what skills you want to develop. Um, and so uh, Derek in the past has recommended that folks turn to Imagine PhD, and I'm happy to share the link with folks to Imagine PhD, but it's a really useful um, assessment tool that they have all sorts of quizzes and sort of assessments that you can take that might help you identify some of the skills that you have, some of the skills that you might need, as well as some of the career paths outside of the tenure track that might be of interest to you. Um, so if you're struggling there, it might be useful to sort of complete one of those quick assessments. I think most of them take under 10 minutes to complete. Um, and it can tell you a lot about what you value. Um, and then that in turn can be useful for you, not only in this application, but in terms of your entire career as a humanist. Um, is there anything you would like to add about question two for you? Yeah, I think Imagine PhD really helped because it's nice to like get your thoughts out on paper and like to see like, oh, I'm really making progress. I'm really trying to figure out exactly who I am. So I definitely recommend the Imagine PhD yeah. tool too. Great. And then the final question is describe a time when you collaborated with others to solve a program, uh, a problem. Um, I think this question is a little bit more self-explanatory, but um, Again, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be within academia. It could be, you know, at a, at a, at a job. It could be um, with your research group. It could be um, any number of examples would work. Um, whenever I applied, I think I told a story of sort of being overwhelmed with a project um, that I had with a research assistantship and I had to work with others to sort of come up with um, an assessment of where we were and where we wanted to go. Um, and so I think there's a lot of different ways that you could approach this particular question. Does anybody have questions about the three statements and what we're looking for um, as you craft those? For number three, are you looking for like a story? Or are you mm -hmm. looking for like a common kind of like collaborative experience? Yeah, so the question was for the third question, are we looking for a story or just like a common collaborative experience? I would say that to think of your entire application as a like cohesive story, right? So like your CV tells us one part of the story, question one, question two, question, they should all fit together to tell a story of why you, this candidate, are a good fit or why this um, community engagement opportunity would further your research, would further your teaching, would further your development as a scholar um, and what have you. Um, I would say the more specific you are, probably the better um, with that question. I think. Again, we're looking for you to be um, upfront and vulnerable with, with the committee um, as much as you're comfortable being. Um, and I think the more specific you get, probably the, the better. That's a good question. Okay, okay so the final part of the application process is a recommendation form. Um, and I'm gonna speak a little bit in depth about this. So. You'll notice that we don't call it a letter of recommendation. Uh, we call it a recommendation form, and that was deliberate. It was set up by Peggy and Derek, and it's intentional because, again, this program is not necessarily about turning to the sort of traditional areas or sources of knowledge that we turn to as humanists, but to think broadly about who it is um, that might be able to speak to your skill sets, to your interests, to your, to your candidacy as an applicant. 
Um, so we're asking folks to fill out a form that has three short questions. So number one, how do they know you, right? So to describe their relationship to you. Um, number two is why do you think the applicant is a strong candidate for this program? Um, and number three is how would you describe the applicant's primary strengths when it comes to collaboration and or community engagement? Um, and so all of these are short answers. They're very easy for a recommender to fill out, but again, it's telling us a picture. It's providing more context in which to understand your application. Um, and you should think carefully about who it is that you want to be your recommender. Um, it could be your advisor, but it might not be your advisor. Um, you know, again, you're thinking about someone who can speak to your ability to collaborate outside of the sort of campus bubble, to can speak to your ability of your skill sets um, and how they translate to community collaboration and engagement and reciprocity. And so for me, that wasn't actually my advisor who could speak to that. It was uh, my supervisor and the university archives who was my recommender. Um, and whenever I applied, she was the, actually the one who was best equipped to speak about my own ability to sort of problem solve, to ask questions, to do all these different things. Um, and so that was for me. Um, Tori, I don't know if you want to comment on who provided your recommendation. Yeah, uh, my uh, recommender was not my advisor, but it was someone who was on my committee. Mm -hmm. So they were able to speak to like the collaboration experiences with like my teaching, but also like my mentorship in the department, which was really cool. So once again, I'll just also uh, note that it doesn't have to be your advisor, but as long as someone is knowledgeable about what you bring to the table mm -hmm. and how you collaborate um, and what you can bring to community engagement yeah. as well. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, Peggy, do you want to say anything else about why you and Derek divide the department <clears throat> this way? Sure. Um, I think a lot of times the letter, and um, especially when folks ask from you know traditional sources such as an advisor or a committee member, tends to be very academic. Um, mm -hmm. And we found that the form kind of deconstructs that a little yeah. bit, and it's mm -hmm. honestly kind of frankly forces the recommender to really think um, outside of, out of the traditional academic letter format. And so these prompts are, in some ways, you know, the background of how you know them are similar to a letter, but they really cut to the chase, which is especially, you know, numbers two and three. Um, and again, yeah, it might not be your advisor. Uh, and it you might not even be somebody who's called themselves right. a professor. Right. So, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And if you were to ask your advisor, what kind of prep work would you have to do <laughs> yeah. for that? So much priming, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd really have to um, go to your advisor and say, here, because I think the key here is, um, why is the candidate strong for this program? Right. So you would have to share with your advisor the website about the bridge. Mm -hmm. You might share some of the posts mm -hmm. that have been yeah. done in the inquiry blog about the folks who have had this experience. You would have to give, and I think this is probably true for anybody that you would ask to to write up to, to fill in this form, but especially yeah. your advisor to make it absolutely clear that this is not your grandmother's job <laughs> application, right? I mean, this yeah. is this is actually something completely different, and they right. cannot, should not cut and paste text right. from right. an already established letter from Pickham and Gates. Dissertation does not occur. Yeah. <laughs> right. So not I, that I, it can't I mean, overlap, but if, if, if you're in a good place with your advisor, I think it's a way of signaling that the world is changing. Yeah. 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 I think that's a great point too, because I think I included um, the website information, but I think I also wrote like a, a blog of like why I wanted to do this, mm -hmm. why would this would match my interest. And it also helped because my committee member knows that I want to make an impact outside of academia mm -hmm. too. So I yeah. tried to like, try to like uh, foreshadow this plan for me that I think helped them write the Exactly. Letter. And that's right. a beautiful, that's a big point that I was getting at is this is a, in many ways an education for folks beyond just the like, right. effects of yes. this fellowship. Mm -hmm. Like a faculty member can kind of learn about this you know, realm that is also a right. benefit to this program. So it's a really good. You know, and apropos of that, there's been a lot of conversation here about how it, this is a great opportunity for you if you want to stay in the tender track. Mm -hmm. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the academy. Yes. <laughs> we're trying to make pathways in the academy for people who want to stay in the academy, they want to do it with their whole self. Yes. They want to bring their whole exactly. self to the table. They want all aspects of themselves to be seen. Mm -hmm. And that will require some changing up. 
yeah. of mm -hmm. how we do business to be better. So I think, and our experience with HWW more broadly is that for folks who stay in the academy, these experiences are value added. Yes, they are, they are absolutely. Better. Yeah. Um, the last point I'm going to make before we turn it over for questions is um, you'll see in the bottom corner, it says do March 1st. That includes the recommendation form. Um, so if you are thinking about applying, like remotely thinking about applying, you should share the application form, the questions with your recommender now, um, just so that they have ample time to read the form, think about your um, candidacy for the position, um, and you should start speaking to them now about you know, what it is, the story that it is that you're trying to tell through your application materials, because all materials, including the form, your stuff, and your recommendation are due on March 1st. So I will close there, and if anyone has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or ask them if you wanna unmute yourself, um, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Has anybody ever proposed an organization that they want to work with? Is there avenues for that? Good question. And I don't know if I'm best equipped to answer that. Um, the matching process, I think there's um, ways in the application that you can signal the kinds yeah. of organizations that you'd be interested in. I don't think naming one would disqualify you in any way, but there's no guarantee that we could, you know, say for sure um, mm -hmm. that that would work. Um, but when, I don't I'm not sure if up if I was not thinking or not paying attention, but if the, during the matching process, you will be able to rank yes. um, yeah. your preferred organizations once we see you have read the application and come up with, based on what you've indicated, some organizations that might be of interest. So you do have some agency in that process, but in terms of applying with one thing in mind, I wouldn't recommend sort of feeling your the best there. Yeah. We do try to emphasize, like on the WCU side of things, again, like we're moving from the community partner to campus, not the other way around. And so it is a mutual, there is reciprocity, there is a sort of giving and taking, but the priorities start with the community partners and that's deliberate, right? It's to sort of disrupt this idea that the university sends knowledge outward into the world, but rather we're trying to take community partners knowledge and bring it to the university, right? Um, so I think you could identify some potential matches but as Peggy said, there's no guarantee that those community partners, that their needs and their priorities are gonna necessarily align with your needs and your priorities. You know, um, when we were designing this at the front end, we, we weighed the question of whether we should allow people to roll up with sort of pre-made suggestions that we, we decided not to. And that's largely because for WCU, they have an ongoing relationship with whoever they place you with well beyond your time there. Mm -hmm. And they are seeking to caretake that relationship and and basically curate it thoughtfully and carefully so that you know they can continue to partner with that person. So that that give and take is the part of the structural you know, commitment of VCU. And if we weren't working with VCU, which I can't imagine us doing this if we were, um, we we learned the well we always respected that, but we learned you know sort of their long-term investment in their relationship with those partners. Mm -hmm. I think it's also good if it's not a perfect match too. Mm -hmm. And I say that because um, I focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, but with the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, it also focused and emphasized health, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding how health um, could inform me about these inequities um, that marginalized mm -hmm. groups are facing. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So once again, going back to humanity, humanity yeah. humanities have a lot Absolutely. to offer. Yeah. 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 A lot to learn. So yeah. yeah. Do you have any more questions? Yeah, go ahead. I have another question. In terms of like your relationship with uh, like mm -hmm. the C C U P H D or or any of the other um, of your cohorts, like mm -hmm. what was your relationship to the organization? Because you're getting mm -hmm. a stipend from the university, and so mm -hmm. are you a volunteer there? But you said you had a supervisor, so I'm just kind of confused about how that works. Yeah, I think that's a great question because in the process, I think I was trying to understand my role too, <laughs> in terms of like being a fellow, but also um, going like beyond a fellow, for instance, because the fellowship or this fellowship is different from like academia. 
fellowships, right? Um, so my role was assisting one of the super or assisting my supervisor who was a member of the equity council. So we met regularly, like every week or every other week. And she invited me to uh, community meetings in addition to the equity council so that I had just a broader understanding of what was happening here um, so that I could successfully um, create this toolkit for them that they could use in the future. So I think it goes back to like that reciprocal process. And I felt that reciprocity um, because I would bring a lot to the table in terms of like researching the history, but also I learned so much from these meetings in terms of how these different community organizations work together with CUPHD as well. Mm -hmm. So it was, I was kind of flexible in my roles. I knew I was a fellow due to like the cohort and staff meetings, but also I knew I was also assisting my supervisor at that. I think I think you're the best possible kind of employee because you're not a volunteer, but they're also not paying you. So yeah. they they are not bearing the burden of the cost when yeah. they have your your labor. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can speak a little bit about this question too. Um, like when I was a fellow, I think one of the things that this program taught me. So I entered during perhaps one of the busiest times for my. I worked for a nonprofit based in Danville. And it was perhaps like the busiest time of year for them. And so something to sort of keep in mind um, as a, a volunteer, as a, a fellow is this idea that they have a lot of things going on, like as a community organization that aren't necessarily tied to the bridge fellowship, right? And so it is a sort of, um, it's teaching you sort of, you know, your own positionality, your own sort of relationship to community partners, to this organization. And it taught me a lot about, you know, nonprofits and like what it would be like to work in a nonprofit. Um, and it it was an interesting experience to have, you know, I did have a direct supervisor. I worked mostly remotely because it was in 2020, 2021. So it was like kind of the midpoint of the pandemic. Um, but it was an opportunity to sort of learn from her supervising and, you know, speak with her and have like those bi-weekly meetings. But it was also an opportunity to learn that like this is one part, one very one tiny little part of a very large nonprofit world, and that they have a lot of other things going on. And so it was, a, it was actually a really powerful learning experience, like to sort of decenter the fellow, right, within this community organization. Yeah. Okay, so we are at one o'clock. Um, so I will end now, but if you have questions about the program, you can email me. Um, I will put my email in the chat. And I'm happy to answer any uh, questions that folks have about the program. Um, 